All right, now what we see here in John chapter 15, it's actually really interesting. What, what, I, want to be do, what I want to do this morning is bring a little bit of balance to what I've been preaching lately and what we've been hearing a lot of that's kind of drawn the focus and the attention of our movement and what we've been doing and with, you know, even just going through the announcements today, how the sodomites are, are protesting these various churches and stuff, and they're all based on the, the statements that have been made um, regarding, a lot of it kind of revolves around the doctrine of, of reprobates as well as just um, having a healthy hatred for sin and for the wickedness in this world. And one thing I want to point out specifically in this chapter, I think it's really interesting, is that it says in verse number 12, you know, this is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, and a man laid down his life for friend. So he talks about all, this, all the loving and the things that we're supposed to be doing with love. And then he goes down and he talks about all the hatred. And he's like, don't be surprised when the world hates you. Don't be surprised that these things are happening. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So he brings up this contrast of loving and hating and, and being hated for the cause of Christ. Jesus came and he's saying, look, greater love hath no man than this. A man laid down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Christ did. He came, he laid down his life for us. Yet he was still hated. And what's, what's ironic, the irony, I think, is, you know, these people that go and protest, they hate the church. They hate the things that are said. They hate, there's a lot of things that they hate. Otherwise, they wouldn't even be in there and making a big, you know, stink about everything. And they're the ones that are saying, oh, you need to love, like, through their hate. It's, it's coming out. And the Bible's saying here that, you know, don't be surprised when the world comes out and hates you. Because that's exactly what happened. And don't tell me it's not hate when they're calling up every single person they possibly can to try to destroy you and ruin you. That's hatred. I mean, it's hatred. You can, oh, it's dislike. No, that's hatred. When you dislike someone, you, you, you know, whatever, you, you, don't, you don't go out of your way to shut things down, to make people lose their jobs, to make them get kicked out of their places, all the other stuff. That's a hatred. And, but the, see, the difference is they're the ones that's saying, like, all hate is bad. Hate, hate, hate. And they throw around this buzzword, hate, 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 as if hate's just always a bad thing no matter what it is. When it's not. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, there's a time to love and a time to hate. There's a time for everything. You can't even have love without a hatred in this world. As long as there's wickedness in this world, there's good in this world. You know, they're, they're the exact opposites, right? They're extreme polar opposites. You have good and evil. You have love, you have hate. And you have to have both in order for either one to really make sense. In order for, for you know, love to make sense or love someone, there has to be an, an opposite. There has to be a hatred that, that um, exists. Now, nobody... No matter how much they want to tell you, loves everybody and everything. If you do, then you love wickedness and you just love all the sin of this world. And if you love all the wickedness, you're going to hate that which is good. You're going to hate the light. When you love darkness, you hate the light. When you love the light, you're going to hate the darkness. You, you cannot combine everything and say, well, I love the good and the bad. That doesn't even make any sense. You can't do it. They're mutually exclusive. You cannot hate, you know, love everything. It's impossible. And if you're going to love God and do the commandments that Jesus has forth, there's going to be hate. Now, like I said, though, I want to give, bring balance to this and a good explanation of the love that Jesus Christ had for us. I want to focus specifically in John chapter 15 on verse number 13, where he said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's the title of the sermon this morning, is Greater love hath no man than this. Jesus Christ had the greatest love of all. Why? Because he laid down his own life in order to save the world, in order to save us. He's the one who came. He had the perfect life. He never did anything wrong. He never sinned against God. Everything he did was right. Everything he did was pleasing unto the Father. Didn't deserve any punishment, yet the world still hated him. No matter what he did, no matter how many people he healed, no matter what good he did, he was still, by and large, hated by the world. They rejected him. They didn't want to believe on him. They didn't believe that he was the Messiah. They did not believe 
that he was who he said he was, and they basically ended up making him out to be a liar. They called him a liar, but um, he obviously came preaching the truth. And he has the love to save our souls, and that's, and that's what he did for us. And it truly is an amazing love. Romans chapter 5, uh, you have to turn, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 2. Romans 5 says in verse 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So what's that saying? It's saying, you know, every once in a while you might find someone who's willing to give their life for a good man. For someone who's, you know, living a pretty good life. Someone who's respected. Someone who you can look to and say, you know what? It's really important that this guy live and, and they're willing to trade their life for someone else. Scarcely. I mean, it's not like a common thing, first of all. But you can find someone that's willing to do that. But the way that God commends his love to us. Now, the new translations will say he demonstrates his love. That's not what commends means. His, when it says here that God commendeth his love, it's like he exalts it and, and, and puts it up so much higher and he commends that love toward us because we're sinners. We don't deserve anything. We are not worthy of respect unto God. God is not a respecter of persons. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all deserve a punishment, an eternal punishment of hell. And even though we're sinners, while we were yet sinners, while we're breaking God's commandments and not listening and not hearkening anything he has to do, God's love is commended so much that Jesus Christ came to still pay the punishment for us and still die on the cross for us. That is an amazing love. It really is. That, is. that is an awesome love that God can look at us and say, I told you not to do these things. I told you to listen to me. I told you to obey. I'm sending my prophets. I'm sending these people. And he still sends his son, his only begotten son, to die on the cross to pay for our sins. Amen. That is incredible love. You know, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. God's love knows no bounds. God's love is, is greater than anything that we could even manage. Imagine, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. One of the reasons why God's love is so great is because it's completely unmerited. We do not earn God's love. We do not work for God's love. He has it for us. Look at your Ephesians 2. Look at verse number 1. Just the fact that salvation is even possible for us demonstrates the love of God. Ephesians 2 verse 1 reads, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved. I love that parenthetical statement right there, because he, he goes out, he starts off saying, Look, you all were children of disobedience. You all were walking after the lust of your flesh. You all were doing, you know, various sins and, and disobedience to God and were by nature the children of wrath. But because God is so rich and abounding in his mercy and his love for us, he says, even when you were dead in your sins, he's quickened you. He means he made you alive again. He gave you a new birth. By grace ye are saved, verse 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast." 
And those two last two verses there, verses 8 and 9, are verses I use all the time out soul winning to demonstrate unto people that love of God, that, hey, salvation is completely by God's grace. And that word grace means it's unmerited, it's undeserved. Grace is something that you receive that you don't deserve. It's given to you. It's, it's grace extended unto you regardless of your merit. And it says here that you're saved through your faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Our own actions, our own works cannot save us. We need God's grace, God's love, God's mercy extended unto us. That is how we get saved at all, is by receiving that as a free gift. A gift, again, the, the definition of a gift, if you add anything to that, like, you know, well, in order to receive this, you have to do some work for me. That's not a gift. You're earning something. Well, I'm going to give this to you, but you've got to give me some money for it. No, that's not a gift either. You're buying it, right? I mean, just the real simple definition, a gift has to be given for free. If it's not free, if you have strings attached, if there's a contract you have to sign, if there's some other commitment that you're making, it's not a gift. A gift is something that's given completely for free. And what you do with that gift does not change the fact that it was a gift given unto you. For example, if I wanted to give this, this Bible to Brother Robert over here and say, Okay, Robert, I'm, I want you to have this, this Bible. It's yours for free. It's a gift. It's a gift unto you. And I come back a year later, I'm like, Why is there all this dust on here? What, you haven't been picking it up and using it? What are you doing? And I take it back from him. Can't do that. I mean, I'd be stealing it from them. A gift has to be completely free, no strings attached. It's yours. It, you, know, you do with it what you're going to do with it. And that is the way that salvation works. It's a gift of God. Romans chapter 4, again, another great passage that demonstrates the, the, the fact that our salvation is completely by grace and has nothing to do with our works. Romans 4 verse 1 says, What shall we say then that Ab excuse me, Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. And notice, this is saying the exact same thing that Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says because he said, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it's not of works, lest any man could boast. Because if it was based on our works, we could brag about it. We could boast, we could say, hey, you know what? You're not going to heaven, but I am. I'm going to heaven because I go to church every day or every week. I pray to God every day. I read the Bible. I go out and I help the poor. Right? The I, 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 I. When you, I do this and I do that and that's why I'm going to heaven. Wrong. You can't boast about that. You can't boast about a gift that's given to you for free. You can't brag about that. All you can brag on is the person that gave it to you. You can't brag on yourself. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. It was just given to you. You did nothing for it. It's just given to you for free. You can't brag about that. And that's why he said, look, if Abraham, and this is a great passage to demonstrate also that salvation has always been by grace through faith. It has never changed. People, so some people say, oh, well, the Old Testament, they had to do these sacrifices and that's what got them saved. No, it has never been possible that the blood of bulls and of goats can save a person. Right. Ever. Those were for a figure for the time then present. They all showed the coming Christ that was going to be sacrificed once for all. That was the purpose of it. That's why they even bring up, he brings up Abraham. Look, Abraham wasn't justified by what works. He wasn't justified by obeying God's commandments. He was justified by his faith. Because if it was, if it was his works that justified him, it said in verse 2, he would be able to glory. He'd be able to brag about that. He said, but not before God. You got no place to glory before God because you're a, Abraham was a sinner. Just like everybody else in this room is a sinner. Verse 3 says, For what said the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Blessed is that person to whom God is not going to hold responsible eternally for the sin that they've committed by casting them into hell. 
That's what he's saying here. And it was the same in Abraham's time, which was prior to the law of Moses. It was the same in David's time, which was after the law of Moses. And it's the same today, after the time of Christ. It's always been the same. And that awesome blessedness, that awesome mercy, that awesome grace, is, is just commends that love of God. And the great love wherewith, wherewith He loved us. And one more reference here, Galatians 2.16, you have to turn, or turn if you would to... Uh, Well, don't turn anywhere just yet. I got, I got some places we're going to go to in a little while. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law there sh shall no flesh be justified. It is evident. It cannot be more clear. We have, and you know what? These are just a few of many, 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 many passages. And look, everyone here this morning is saying, Pastor Burzins, we know this. Pastor Burzins, the vast majority of people who even call themselves Christians will say that, yes, we know that salvation is by grace through faith. But the reason why I'm going in to so much detail. One is to demonstrate the love of God, right? We're, we're balancing here, and, and it's all going to tie together. You're going to know exactly where I'm going when we, by the time we get to the end of this sermon. But it is important to make sure that these truths are clear because there are many deceivers that try to back in right. works through the back door. Right. They try to confuse the very simple message of salvation and try to mix in their works. And, and the false prophets use great guile and deceit that will do this in a very subtle way. And it has a large impact on a lot of people because I, the vast majority of people I talk to have this, some, you know, these warped views of what salvation actually is. And you have to watch out for the subtle deceptions. And I'm going to name one name this morning of a person that is a false prophet that has subtly altered and has a false gospel that's very popular today, and his name is John MacArthur. Right. Now, hear me out if, it's, if this is someone that, that you uh, have read or, or, or have listened to before in the past hear out the message because I'm going to explain for you where the error is in his doctrine and I actually have a, a, a whole passage here that was taken he has a website called Grace to You and that's his organization and when you look at what the organization is for it's it's for promoting the whole um, everything that he believes in. it's a whole ministry that he has created so this is basically what he believes and, I, and I'm gonna read it for you word for word and I'm gonna explain to you why this is heresy and why this is so bad because we read the Bible passages I mean it couldn't be more clear it has nothing to do with our works it has nothing to do with any of that stuff it's completely free it's completely by grace is completely a free gift and honestly when you talk to, to even John McGarry you probably say oh yeah that's true but we're going to read what he actually teaches and I'm going to show you that you know just because you use a few different words and you try to change things around a little bit doesn't mean that, that uh, saying you believe it's by grace through faith doesn't mean to actually believe it or even necessarily teach it uh, here's the passage I'm going to start reading and it's it, this is regarding lordship salvation and what lordship salvation teaches, and this is in their own words what it teaches, is basically that you have to make Jesus the Lord of your life, that he has to become your Lord, that he, like Jesus has to be a Lord. And what a Lord is, is someone who tells you what to do and that he's the one that's, you know, I'll tell you that you have to make him the Lord. You say, well, what's wrong with that? He is the Lord. Well, he is the Lord. That's true. But what, let, me, let me just get into this and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you why this is false. Uh, I'm going to start reading. This is from, the, from his website regarding Lordship Salvation. I mean, when you look up Lordship Salvation on his website, this is what comes up, and it's an explanation of what it means. And they're saying, yes, we believe Lordship Salvation. Here's what it says. The gospel that Jesus proclaimed 
was a call to discipleship, a call to follow him in submissive obedience, not just a plea to make a decision or pray a prayer. Jesus' message liberated people from the bondage of their sin while it confronted and condemned hypocrisy. It was an offer of eternal life and forgiveness for repentant sinners, but at the same time it was a rebuke to outwardly religious people whose lives were devoid of true righteousness. It put sinners on notice that they must turn from sin and embrace God's righteousness. Our Lord's words about eternal life were invariably accompanied by warnings to those who might be tempted to take salvation lightly. He taught that the cost of following him is high, that the way is narrow and few find it. He said many who call him Lord will be forbidden from entering the kingdom of heaven. And that's found in Matthew 7 that they're referencing. And we're going to go to that in just a minute. So actually, just turn if you would to Matthew 7 because we're going to get to that in a few minutes. Now, there's a couple more paragraphs I'm going to read for you. But this is really, really subtle what he's doing here because he's mixing in a lot of truths from the Bible, a lot of, a lot of things that, that sound right and are right, and he's, and he's, but he's, the way that he's using them is not right. For example, the way that he's using Matthew chapter 7 here is not right. Yes, Jesus Christ, of course, said that the way is narrow. Of course, there's few that find it. But it's not because it's difficult, which is what he's implying here. The way the implication here is what he's reading is that, you know, hey, it's it, even from his first sentence, he says the gospel that Jesus proclaimed was a call to discipleship. A call to discipleship is not the gospel. Right. That is not the gospel. The good news is the saving faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Being a disciple of Christ and following in Christ's footsteps and doing the works and doing all these things is not the same as salvation. Amen. Salvation is a free gift. It is not a contract of, well, you have to follow me. You have to do all these works. You have to do everything. Look, Jesus Christ had many people saved. If you're going to say that, that it has to be a call to discipleship, that people got saved, then Jesus had a failure of a ministry because there was very few people, even at the time of his death, that stuck with him. Right. And this is an indication of, of how false that is. When Jesus Christ was crucified, he had his 12 disciples, which all forsook him and fled anyways, by the way, when he got arrested. And then a group of maybe 70 people or maybe 120, you know, up to after the resurrection, it was still a very small group of people. Does that mean that... For example, the woman at the well or any of these other people that Jesus Christ came into contact with and preached the gospel to, just no, no one was getting saved. I mean, they weren't following. They weren't discipling. Now look, God has a call. Jesus Christ gave us the, the, the proclamation in the Great Commission, which is the work that he sent his disciples out to do, which is to preach the gospel to every creature and baptizing them and making disciples of them and teaching all nations. Look, those are all great works to do and those are all things that we ought to do and that is the Great Commission that uh, Jesus has given unto us. But that is not the gospel. All of those things are not the gospel. Preaching the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is what the good news is, is that Jesus Christ came and he died for our sins. That's the gospel. So from the very first sentence, he says, the gospel that Jesus proclaimed was a call to discipleship. No, you're mixing terms there. Jesus Christ came and proclaimed the gospel, and he also wanted people to be disciples and to follow him, but they're two separate things. It says a call to follow him in submissive obedience. Did Jesus want people to be in submissive obedience to him? Yes, he does. Is that the gospel? No, it's not. It says not just a plea to make a decision or pray a prayer. And this whole passage is riddled with, with these subtle inferences and, and, and teachings of, of combining two things that are not alike and they do not belong together together. Um, the way that they're, they're mixing them. It says here is an offer of eternal life and forgiveness for repentant sinners. Now, yes and no, but it depends on your definition of repentant. 
And I'm going to get to that in a minute. We're, we're, we're going to go through. I've got some, some scripture to, uh, to back up all of my claims and why I believe. what it, th This whole thing, this whole passage, this excerpt that I'm reading from, has one reference, and it's to Matthew 7, and we're going to look at that. But all the rest of these claims that he's making have zero references to scripture. Because it's not there. And then, so it says that uh, eternal life and forgiveness for repentant sinners. Okay, caveat though, what do you mean by repentant? Because many people have different definitions of that these days. It says, but at the same time, it was a rebuke to hourly religious people whose lives were devoid of true righteousness. Yes, the Pharisees were being rebuked also. Of course they were. It says it put sinners on notice that they must turn from sin and embrace God's righteousness. No. Again, for salvation, no. Should we be turning from our sin? Absolutely. Is it requirement for salvation? No. And again, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Hear me out. Our word, this is our Lord's words about eternal life, were invariably accompanied by warnings to those who might be tempted to take salvation lightly. Um, and here it says, He taught that the cost of following Him is high. Yes, it is. The cost of following Christ, that is very clearly taught in the Bible, that the cost of following Christ is high. He says, yea, all that live godly in Christ, in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Look, when you do what's right, when you follow Christ, the world's going to hate you. We read that in the opening passage this morning. We know that there's going to be problems. We know that it's not the easy life. We know that doing the right thing is not easy. It's hard. It comes at a cost to be his disciple. But then he mixes in the cost of following him and says that the way is narrow and few find it. The way being narrow and few finding it is in regards to salvation. It's not in regards to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. They're two separate things. The way being narrow, do you know what narrow means? It's, it's, it's narrow, right? There's, there's, there, you can't go off to the left. You can't go off to the right. But that's not talking about your walk. That's not talking about how many sins you commit. It's narrow because it's only through Jesus Christ. Because there's many doors, there's many paths to follow. You can go Islam, you can follow Muhammad, you can follow Buddha, you can follow all these different things and all these different paths. But there's only one path that leads to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. It's narrow. Amen. It's exclusive. It has to be through Christ alone. That's why he says it's narrow. And the fact that there's few that find it, it's because broad is the way that leads to destruction. There's many ways to not be saved. And there's only one way to be saved. But it's not because it's difficult. Not difficult at all. It is easy to be saved. We'll get, I'm going to read here a little bit more from, from, his, uh, from their explanation of Lordship Salvation. Present day evangelicism, evangelicalism, excuse me, present day evangelicalism by and large, and we're not evangelical, you know, we're in the terms of the labels that they put out there. It says, present-day evangelicalism, by and large, ignores these warnings. The prevailing view of what constitutes saving faith continues to grow broader and more shallow, while the portrayal of Christ in preaching and witnessing becomes fuzzy. I can agree with that statement. You know, there's a lot of people that, that, that are shallow, and there's a lot of people that, that don't portray Christ preaching, preaching very clearly, and it's fuzzy, sure. But then it goes on, anyone who claims to be a Christian can find evangelicals willing to accept a profession of faith, whether or not the person's behavior shows any evidence of commitment to Christ. Now, I take, I take issue with that statement. Because Romans 10 tells us that if thou shalt believe in thine heart, and you know, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you make a profession of faith, I can't see your heart. But I'm just going to assume that the words that, that, that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh and that when you make a profession that all of your faith is on Christ, I'm going to assume that you mean that. That you actually believe that. Now, if you follow somebody close enough, you're going to find that they sin. I don't care who they are. So as soon as a person sins, you say, oh, you don't have the right commitment to Christ because you sin. Where do you draw the line then? Do you say to the brand new baby infant in Christ, I thought you got saved. What do you do and open up that beer bottle? Well, 
Well, why all of a sudden is that sin make him not saved anymore? Right. It doesn't. Being saved is not a commit. It's not saying, God, I promise I'll never touch the bottle again. Please save me. That's not what salvation is. You're not making a deal with God of getting rid of sins in your life. Now, should you get rid of sins in your life? Of course we should. Of course we should. That goes without saying. We know that we should. But when someone makes a profession of faith from their heart and they say that with, you know, they believe on Christ, it doesn't make them not saved because they're living in the flesh, which we all still have. Now, I'm going to continue on here. It says, in this way, faith has become merely an intellectual exercise. No, I don't think that faith should be merely an intellectual exercise either, though. That's not what we preach or believe. The Bible says, you know, if you believe on him with all of your heart. It's a heart thing. You, you definitely need to, to put your faith in Christ with all of your heart. It's not just a mind thing. It's not accepting effects. See, what he does is he builds up this kind of a straw man of saying that, well, see, these people believe that all you have to do is believe some facts about Jesus. Just that there was a man named Jesus, he lived and he died, and that, you know, like... No, that's not what we teach or preach or believe. We believe those facts, but just believing in a certain set of facts doesn't make a person saved either. You have to be putting your faith on Christ as your Savior. You have to rely on Him for your salvation. It's not a difficult concept, right? But it's easy to build up this straw man and say, oh, they're just making it all intellectual. They're all just making this a mind thing where, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross? Check. Do you believe that, you know, like, in just, in just, just a, a, a set of, of um, you know, intellectually believing that this person existed? That's not what it is. It says, instead of calling men and women to surrender to Christ, modern evangel evangelism asks them only to accept some basic facts about him. Now, that's not what we teach, that just to accept some facts. But we also don't say that you have to surrender to Christ. When you surrender, you're giving up all of control, everything that you have to his will, to whatever it is that he wants to do, and that's not, that's not salvation. I mean... You're, you're surrendering, and the only sense you're surrendering is that you realize there's nothing that you can do for salvation. Again, these, these words are slick. I'm going to read the last paragraph that I have here from his website. It says, This shallow understanding of salvation and the gospel, known as easy believism, and by the way, you know what this church believes in? Easy believism. Amen. Why? Because believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is easy. Amen. Because there's no work involved in putting your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because salvation is a free gift, and all you got to do is receive it. Amen. There is no work involved in receiving that gift. It is easy. Now, many people don't believe it. But it's easy. It is not difficult. It does not require you to even change your life. You just have to receive that free gift. And again, ought you to change your life? Of course you should. Easy believes them. It says, stands in stark contrast to what the Bible teaches. No, it doesn't. I'm going to prove it. To put it simply, the gospel call to faith presupposes that sinners must repent of their sin and yield to Christ's authority. This is in a nutshell, is what is commonly referred to as lordship salvation. That's from John MacArthur's website. That's what they're defining. Lordship salvation is that a sinner must repent of their sin and yield to Christ's authority. It's false. Now, I said I was going to... Did I have you go to Matthew 7? Because yes. before I get into the repentance, I want to just, just show you really quickly what Matthew 7 is talking about. Because he references Matthew 7 by saying... You know, many who called him Lord will be forbidden from entering the kingdom of heaven. And I just want you to understand this because a lot of works-based salvation people will like to turn to Matthew 7 to, to promote their false doctrine. And it's funny because I actually have Matthew 7 highlighted and all the verses I've highlighted in my Bible is I take this out so winning are the verses I like to show people that salvation is by grace through faith. So they turn there to show you that it's by works. I turn there to show you it means the exact opposite. Matthew 7, verse 21 says, well, they start, see, they start at verse 13 because 13 says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, 
One other point, because they do reference that section, in the King James Bible, it says narrow and straight. Straight and narrow mean the same thing. They're synonyms. In the New Versions, it says narrow and difficult. It says difficult is the way. Not straight. It replaces straight with difficult. So when they have people turning there, you can see all of a sudden, oh, it's narrow, and it's, if it's difficult, then you're going to start thinking, well, wait, what does that mean? Like, I can't, you know, if I'm walking this way, and I'm, start, you know, thinking about their, their, their physical walk of their, you know, committing sins. Because that's the way it's taught, is that the straight and narrow, I mean, how many times have you ever, the, the straight and narrow path, that if you sin, basically you're deviating from the straight and narrow path. Well, the salvation straight and narrow is just, just through Christ. If you sin, it doesn't mean that Christ is no longer your Savior. And then in verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets, ironically, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but out inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? And see, what they do is they kind of skip over verse 15, and they use verses 16 and 17 of judging a person of whether or not they're saved based on their fruits. Right? But what was the context? Verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets. It's the false prophet that you can judge by their fruits, not just any average person, because what is a fruit? A fruit is something that is produced from a tree, right? The tree, if you have an apple tree, it's going to produce apples. That's how you know it's an apple tree, because you look at the fruit that's being produced. Teachers or prophets have proselytes. They have converts. So the, the, the fruit that is produced by a prophet is the convert. And that's why Jesus Christ said that, you know, basically the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were making their proselytes twofold more, more a child of hell than themselves. He could judge the Pharisees by their fruits because the proselytes they were making were twofold, twofold more a child of hell than themselves. And here, you look at the false prophets, you can look at their converts, and he says, because outwardly they look like a sheep, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. And, and, and he goes on to explain that the fruits is every good tree bringeth forth good tree, good fruit, and a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Again, talking about the false prophet, not about just your average believer. Because everybody has sin. Everybody does. Like I said, it doesn't matter. No, no, you look at someone long enough, you're going to find sin. And then he continues on here because, you know, we're going to go actually farther than what they, uh, the reference that they have here. Verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There are going to be many people that are deceived on Judgment Day when they're standing before God say, God, you know, why are you sending me in hell? Look, we've done all these great works. Says, we prophesied in thy name. We've cast out devils. We've done all these great works. Why are they denied? Because they're trusting in their works. Because they're saying, God, look, if, if I were to die right now and I stood face to face with God and God asked me, why should I let you into heaven? I'll tell you what I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say, well, God, I was pastoring Word of Truth Baptist Church. God, look, I was going out and I was preaching Jesus. God, look at all these things that I did for you. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say, God, you said whosoever believeth <laughs> shall have eternal life. You said that Jesus came and paid for my sins. I believe that. I, I just believe your word. I, I mean, I believe that, that you, you gave us your words in the Bible, and I believe that. That's what I'm trusting in. That's where my salvation lies. But see, in this story in Matthew 7, these people were confronted with God, and they're saying, Lord, Lord, they're calling on God, and they're saying, look, we've done all these good works. And that's why they're cast out. That's why they're not entering into the kingdom. It's not because they've sinned. It's because, well, I mean, ultimately, you know, we're all responsible for our own sins. But it's because they didn't accept Christ as their Savior. They were trusting in their own works. They thought, they, they might have even thought they were doing the right thing. 
But they didn't, they didn't get born again. They didn't put their faith in Christ. And he, that's why he says, I never knew you. And see, some of you people believe you could lose your salvation, miss that point too. I never knew you. It isn't that I used to know you, but then you backslid and, and now I don't know you anymore. So I never knew you. Turn, if you would, to Jonah in the Old Testament, Jonah chapter 3. And I know I, I've preached this many times over, and you know what? I'm going to continue to preach this uh, until Christ comes back. Amen. Because especially in our time, this, this doctrine has gotten so confused. It's been so widely taught because of men like John MacArthur that teach this false gospel. And these people that teach this, uh, you know, you have to make a commitment to Christ. What are we committing to? Are we committing to following Him? Are we giving our life? You know, people say, well, I gave my life to Christ. That's a backwards gospel. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave His life for you. You don't give your life to Him for salvation. He gave His life for you. You just have to accept it. Now, again, it's so subtle because should we be giving our lives to Christ? Absolutely. Should we completely yield to Him? Should we go out and be His disciples and do whatever it is that God has for us to do and offer our bodies up a living sacrifice, as the Bible says? Yes. But that's not part of salvation. It's not part of salvation. It's our will to offer up our bodies unto Him Salvation is receiving the exact opposite that Christ gave his life for us. And we believe on that for our salvation. In turn, being thankful and loving the God that loved you and saved you in the way that we demonstrate our love for him is by keeping his commandments, by offering up our bodies a living sacrifice, by doing all these things and following Christ in that way. But that is not how you get saved, nor does it mean if a person doesn't show all of that thanks to God and be willing to just live all out completely for Christ, it doesn't mean they didn't get saved. Do you remember when Jesus Christ healed the ten lepers? He healed ten of them. They all were healed of their disease. They all were made whole. But how many came back to thank Him? One. Does that mean that the other nine weren't ever cleansed at all to begin with because only one came back to thank Him? Nope. They were all cleansed, but only one came back to show respect and to show thanks and to actually tell God, hey, thank you. Thanks for doing that. And to actually do something about it. There are people that get saved because they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that is what is required for salvation. They may not ever step foot in this church. They may not ever step foot in any church. But the requirement for salvation is not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and go to church. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If a person does that, they're saved. Amen. Now, when that happens... There's a new creature that's born inside of them. And they have got the Holy Ghost now to, tell, to help, you know, hey, you know, you ought to be doing this to help guide them. But they still have decisions to make in their life. God doesn't force you to do anything. And people can still decide, look, I'm a living example of this. I got saved when I was 20 years old. It took me a long time to get right with God and actually get, in, get my butt into church and start you know, learning and listening and actually do something for God. I lived for myself for a long time. It doesn't mean I wasn't saved. And I tell people this, you know, we'll say, yeah, but now you're not, right? Now we can see the fruit. Okay, fair enough. Now you can see a difference. I could have died easily while I was living in the world, I could have overdosed. I could have, I could have you know, gotten drunk and, and died in a car wreck. You would have never known. But I was saved. My faith was on Jesus Christ. I did have the Holy Spirit inside of me. I dealt with the conviction from time to time. I dealt with it. I knew it was there. But I still made my own choice. 
and there are people out there that have their faith in Christ, you cannot say that you know for sure that they're not saved because they're not doing anything. Now, I have no problem with treating people as if they're not saved, if they're just living just completely in the world. And what I mean by that is, hey, all the more reason to give them the gospel. Great. If that means that you're preaching the gospel to someone who's already saved, okay. If you say, well, I don't see any reason, I mean, there's no incident, you know, anything in their life that's showing me that this person's saved, great, preach them the gospel. Amen, do it. If they're already saved, okay. If they're already saved, say, what are you doing then? Get in church, right? I mean, use that as an opportunity, but it doesn't mean that you could just say, there's no way that person's saved. Right. You can't say that. There's a difference between being a disciple of Jesus and a believer in Jesus. Just as there's a difference between having a son and having a son that follows in the footsteps of his father. Many, many fathers have businesses and their sons will grow up and they take over the family business, right? And they learn all the ways and they learn everything they need to do. But there's also many, many fathers that have a business and their sons don't do that. It doesn't mean that they're not their sons. I mean, think about the prodigal son in the Bible. There's a man that has two sons. The one takes his inheritance, he goes out and wastes it, and he you know, does a riotous living, he parties it up. But the other son stays back home. And he does what he's supposed to do. And he's following his father, and he's following what he's supposed to do. And I know it's a parable, but look, the parable is that they were both his sons to begin with. So the, product, the son that left and then ended up coming back, he was always a son. He was always a son to his father. The father in that, in that parable represents God, our father. And the son represents a wayward son, a son that, that went away and ended up returning. And when a son is always a son, which is why the father was always looking out for him. When he came back, he saw him afar off. He's like, hey, there's my son. And he was super happy about it. He said, Come on back, son. You're always welcome here because he's his son. He wasn't a bastard. He was a son. And if you're born again, you are a son of Jesus Christ. You're a son of God the Father. Um, you're an adopted son. You have the new spirit, the new creature living inside of you. Now, um, about the, the repentance thing, and there's a lot of stuff I want to get to and wrap it all up. People say, well, well, I thought repentance was necessary for salvation. And yes, as I mentioned earlier, repentance is necessary depending on your definition of the word repent. Now, a good way to remember what the word repent means, if, uh, does anyone know what the word pensive means? Or pensive, you know Spanish, pensar, is to think. Someone who's pensive is someone who's very thoughtful. Re is again. Repent is to think again. Okay? It's a real simple way to, to think of it. I know it's not necessarily the, the full-on whole definition, but it's a good way to, to remember what it means. Repent means you're changing your mind, you're turning, you're, you're reconsidering something, you're, 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 you're changing what you believe okay? about anything. You're changing what you think about something. And what we have today is a lot of people that teach that the word repent automatically includes sin. So that when they see the word repent, they say, oh, we have to turn from your sins. People, I've asked people, well, define repent for me. Oh, to turn from your sins. That is not the definition of repent. What you're repenting of or from or about is dependent on the context that it's used in. And the perfect example of this is God in the Bible, in the King James Bible, by the way, again, another thing that has changed in the modern translations, they have removed the, the, the usage of the word repent from the Old Testament. Why? Because God repents more than anybody else in the Bible. God repents in the Old Testament. And you're in Jonah chapter 3. Look at verse number 10. The Bible reads, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So there we see God repenting. Is God a sinner? No. Does God have to turn from his sins? No. Of course not. But God repented, so wait a minute. If repent means to turn from your sin, then God turned from his sin. No, he didn't. Because he didn't have any sin. That's right. 
That's because the word repent doesn't have to always mean sin. It just means he changed his mind. So when God repents here, he repented of the evil. Evil means he's bringing harm because this was, uh, Jonah was preaching to the city of Nineveh. Nineveh was going to be destroyed. He said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. It was a message from God saying, look, in 40 days from now, God's going to come and he's going to rain down and he's going to destroy your city. Right? And that was God's intent. That's what God was planning on doing, was destroying Nineveh. But what happened? God saw their works. And what were their works? He saw what they were doing. Their works that they turned from their evil way. Sounds an awful lot like repenting of their sins. They turned from their evil way. They're doing all kinds of wickedness. They're doing these bad things. And they turned from that. And they said, God, we're sorry. We're going to do what's right now. And the Bible calls that works. Right. If you believe that a person has to turn from their evil ways for salvation, then by definition, you believe in a works-based salvation. Right. And now you've got a contradiction because the Bible says it's not of works. Was it good that they turned from their evil way? Of course it was. God spared, God, God changed his mind. He said, you know, I was planning on destroying your city. Now I'm not going to because you're starting to do what's right. I preached a sermon uh, about a year or so ago on the, the salvation of a nation. The things that a nation or a country or a city have to do in order to receive mercy from God is not the same as what a person needs to do individually to be saved. You see, when the city was given over to wickedness and, and just doing all these, these horrible things, when they changed that, when they stopped being so vile, God said, okay, I won't destroy you anymore. But that's not what a person does in order to receive eternal salvation. Again, in order to receive eternal salvation, all a person has to do is put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, wait a minute then. Why did Jesus and John the Baptist preach repentance then? Why did they do it? Well, because repentance doesn't always have to do with sin. I'll read for you. Matthew 3, 1 says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus Christ, in Matthew 4, 17, says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Did Jesus and John the Baptist preach repentance? Absolutely they did. Yes. Repent! But... In those passages, and, and you can look up all the other ones that, that will reference Jesus or John the Baptist or anybody teaching or preaching salvation in the Bible and using the word repent. Did you see sin in, that, in those verses or in that context? Look it up later. They don't mention sin. They say to repent. Again, what does it repent mean? It's change your mind. So, if salvation comes by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to receive your salvation... Where's the repentance? What do you have to change? What, do you, what is it that you have to change? What else do you have to reconsider? You have to change whatever it is that you were trusting in prior to Christ. Right. If it's trusting in the Catholic Church to save you, you have to change that. You cannot put your faith in Christ and still trust that the Catholic Church is required for your salvation. It has to be all in Christ. If you're trusting in an idol, like many people were at that time, if you're trusting in this false god, this image... You have to stop believing in that and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you, whatever your belief is in, it could be in all manner of things. Your own works. Hey, I'm not that bad of a person. I do pretty good things. If that's what you believe is getting you to heaven, you need to repent. Amen. Change what you believe because that is not going to save you. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop putting your faith in yourself. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yes, repentance is necessary. But it does not mean you have to turn away from or give up a sinful life in order to be saved because that is works. Turning from wicked ways is works. Should we turn from wicked ways? Yes, of course, but it's not salvation. There is a huge distinction there and it's extremely important because it means the difference between heaven and hell for people. I talk to people that their faith is in the fact that they've turned from the bad things that they were doing in order to go to heaven. They add Jesus in there, but when you, when you add works, it's works-based salvation. 
<clears throat> and even in Acts 19, verse 4, the Apostle Paul explains what John was preaching when he talked about repentance. And if you don't have this highlighted or, or marked up your Bible, this is great. Another, besides Jonah 3, when people want to claim that, you know, or not claim, but, but rightfully bring up, well, hey, John the Baptist or Jesus preached repentance. The Apostle Paul explains in Acts 19, verse 4, he says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. Right? John preached repentance. And the baptism they baptized with is the baptism of repentance. But here's what he defines it as. It says, I'll read, I'll read it again. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Amen. John's baptism of repentance was preaching that they needed to believe on Jesus Christ. That was the repentance that John the Baptist was preaching as the Apostle Paul spells it out in Acts 19.4. <clears throat> By requiring the extra work, the extra effort of you getting rid of your sins, of you doing this, of you doing that, of you being baptized, of you doing whatever, that cheapens the gift that God has given you and it lowers the love he has for us. How does it cheapen the gift? Well, the way it cheapens the gift is saying that the blood of Jesus Christ was not sufficient completely to give you eternal life. Because if you have to do something else, if you have to turn from sins, if you have to do anything else other than just receiving that gift, receiving the gift that was bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're saying, well, that wasn't quite enough. It was close, but not quite enough. There's still something more that you have to do. It cheapens a gift. And it, it's adding your own boasting to all the, the glory and honor and credit that goes to God. <clears throat> now, our eternal life, it's unmerited. It's undeserved. It's by grace. But it is conditional. Because not everyone just receives the gift. It's up to us to receive it. Receive it. Romans 10, 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Acts 16, of course, says, Yo, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. The condition is just whether or not you put your faith in Christ, whether or not you believe on him. Believe on him with your heart. Once you do that, the condition's met. It's not a work. Believing on Christ is not a work. But it is the way that you receive it. The gift is offered. It's been offered to everybody. For God so loved the world. It's there. It's hanging out there. In, 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 a, in, a, you know, in a sense, God's reaching out His hand and saying, Here, I've got this gift. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Reaching out your hand and taking this Bible if I'm offering this as a gift to you, that's not work. You, it's, you have to receive it, right? That's how you receive it. Putting your faith in Christ is not a work. It's just how you receive His gift. It's all it is. And once you do that, that gift is yours. You have eternal life. You're safe forever. Salvation is easy. It is easy. It's as easy as receiving a gift. Jesus Christ said it's as easy as taking a drink of water. It's as easy as piece of eating a piece of bread. It's as easy as walking through the door. All those things are easy. Easy believism, yes. Amen. It's so easy, though. Many people have mixed up their ideas about it. And some people say, well, if it's that easy, then why doesn't everyone just get saved? I mean, it's that easy. It's a good question. Yeah. That's why I ask. Why, why isn't everyone just being saved? Because it is that easy. You know what? It's that easy because God is not, the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to be saved, and that's why He made it that easy, because He loved the whole world. He wants everyone to be saved. That's God's desire. I want you all to be saved, and I've made it so easy for you. Just please receive a free gift. I bought and paid for it. It's right here for you. Just accept it. Just believe it. You and I know that there's still some people that won't accept it. Won't do it. It's easy, and most won't. 
The other problem I see, though, with this, with this truth, and, and, and people trying to get their mind around this, is they'll oftentimes then think that because salvation is so easy that everybody that claims to be a Christian is, is saved. And that's false also. Okay, now, I don't want to confuse or, or make my words seem, seem to be contradictory with what I said earlier. If someone professes faith in Jesus Christ, they're saved. You know, like, we have to take, put this way, you have to take someone based on their words, right? If someone has, has some sins in their life, I'm not going to automatically just say that person's not saved. But I'm going to base it off of what they say. And people say, well, yeah, but if they say believe in Jesus, then, then they're saved, right? Well, not necessarily. Because it's what do they actually believe in their heart? What do they really believe? It's not just do they believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead in their, in their head, just believing that that's a fact. Is their faith on Christ as their Savior to, sa to save them from hell? And a lot of people that will start off by saying they believe in Jesus, when you start asking the questions, you'll get to the heart of the matter. And this is what we do when we go out and preach the gospel. And this is what I believe anybody who wants to be successful at, make, at, at converting people to Christ needs to do. Unfortunately, a lot of people just go on the assumption and say, hey, do you believe in Jesus? And if they say, yeah, well, great man, you're saved. N not necessarily, because just because they say that doesn't mean that's where their heart is. And what I mean by this is this. The way that I get to the heart of the matter when I talk to people, after I go through the whole gospel, I, you know, I do all this other stuff, I'll ask me, I'll give an example. An illustration is always a good way to understand what is in a person's heart. What do they actually believe? And I use a really extreme example. And I'll say something like, you know, I'll, I'll make up a fictitious person and I'll say, you know, this person, Johnny, he's 20 years old. He puts his faith on the Lord Jesus Christ today. And I'll say, is he saved? And for, for the purpose of this example, we could see his heart that he actually does it, right? He believes. According to the Bible, I mean, Scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, right? He's saved. Ten years later, he gets in all kinds of sin. You know, he's married. He ends up committing adultery. He gets drunk. He kills somebody. He kills himself. You know, all this, this really horrible sins. That a lot of people will say, well, no, he's not saved. He's going to hell because he did all those sins. But what that shows when a person makes that type of response or an answer, they don't believe that either Christ paid for all of his sins or that it's eternal life, that it lasts forever. They don't believe that. Because if you could lose your salvation, you don't believe that it's eternal. If you, if you believe that, that uh, there's sins that you could still commit and God's going to send you to hell, then you don't believe that Christ paid for all of your sins. Right? That's what helps to bring you to the heart of what a person believes, is, is using those illustrations or those examples. Now, it's also impossible to believe in something if you don't even understand it. And this is a problem with a lot of people. And, and usually these are people that are the easiest to get saved. That, that a lot of times people think they're saved already, but they, don't, they never quite fully understood the gospel. As simple of a message as it is, a lot of people don't quite get it. Now, if you don't understand the gospel, there's no way you can believe in it. You can't believe on it. You can't believe on something you don't even understand what it, what it is or what it means. I'm going to be very clear now about who I'm going to say is not saved according to Scripture. If you believe any work or obedience to God's law is required, you're not saved. If you think that a work is required in order for you to have salvation, you're not saved. If you believe that you can lose your salvation, you're not saved. If you believe you must be baptized in order to be saved, Physically, just, just being baptized and dunked underwater, you're not saved. If you believe someone can be saved without Jesus, you're not saved. If you believe you must repent of your sins for salvation, you're not saved. And all this is proven by Scripture. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We're almost done. First John chapter 5 gives us a real simple couple verses here that explain that if you don't believe these things, you're calling God a liar. And if you don't believe these things, you're not saved. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 10. The Bible reads, 
He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. So he's saying, you know, hey, if you believe, you've got the witness in yourself. You're born again, right? And if you don't believe, well, then you're calling him a liar. So if I, if I make a statement up here just about anything, say, hey, I have a white minivan. You can either believe me or not. But if you don't believe me, you say, yeah, I don't believe you. Then what are you saying? You're implying that I'm a liar. That I don't really have a white minivan. Right? That's what you're doing. So what he's saying here, he's saying, look, if you don't believe God, you're making him a liar. If you don't believe what, what God said in his word, then basically you're saying, God, you're a liar. And he says the way that a person is making God a liar is by not believing the record that God gave of his son. And then, of course, thankfully, verse 11 gives us the record that must be believed in order not to call God a liar. Verse 11 says, and this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. You have to believe that or else you're calling God a liar. And there's three things that are, that are part of that record in this one verse here. It says that God hath given to us Given means it's a gift. Given means it's grace. Given means it's unmerited. It's not earned. It's not deserved. It's given. Eternal life, eternal means forever. The word eternal means forever. If you don't believe that, that eternal life lasts forever, if you don't believe that it, that it goes on and on and on forever and never ends, you're not believing the record that God gave. If you believe you can lose that salvation, then it doesn't last forever. And I tell people like this, look, Jesus Christ said in John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He says, you have everlasting life right at that moment. The moment I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I had everlasting life. And not only did I have it then, I have it now. And since it's everlasting, I'm going to have it in the future infinitum. That's right. Just going all the way up because it's everlasting. Now, if I do something or say something and God ends up sending me to hell, I never had everlasting life. At the best, I had temporary life. But I never had everlasting life because it didn't last forever. In order to, for it to be everlasting life, it has to last forever. So he's given to us eternal life. It's a gift. It's eternal. And this life is in his son. It's only through Christ. It's only through Jesus. There's no other way to get it. There's no other way to heaven. Those are the three things. If you don't believe that record, the Bible says you're making God a liar. And that's why I said when I went down that list, you know, if you believe you can lose your salvation, you're making God a liar according to this verse. You believe you need to be baptized to be saved. It's not just given to you. It's not, it's not free. It's that you know, you're doing something for it. You're working for it. You'll be saved without Jesus. It, no, it's through His Son. God's love is amazing. His free gift. Turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 1. So I want to make one last point, and I, don't, I can't skip over this. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Because this all ties in back around again to the, to the teaching of the, you know, the reprobate doctrine and stuff. And we can look at these things, and you could say, well, you know, salvation's so easy, and you guys believe this. You believe that, that it's so easy to be saved. Then how is it even possible like, that these people can be rejected and you know and God loves us and he wants us all to be saved. Yes. How is it that there's these people <clears throat> that are rejected of God? Well, let's start reading in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse number 14. Bible reads in the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I, have chi I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. The Apostle Paul is saying, look, this is worthy of all. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. 
That's when he, when he came the first time, that's why he came. Amen. He came and he gave his life and he showed us his love. And he says, of whom I am chief. He's like, I'm the chiefest of the sinners. Why? What did the Apostle Paul do? He persecuted the church of God. He went after, literally, he was arresting people. He was standing there when, when Stephen got stoned to death. He actually helped to cover that up. He committed all kinds of sins, all kinds of things, and he was against the cause of Christ. And he says, Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, he's saying, Look, if anybody can receive mercy, I can receive mercy. And he's saying, How great is, is the, the long suffering of God in order to extend mercy unto me, someone who's done all these things, all these, these wicked sins against God. He says, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him in everlasting life. He's saying, I'm, show, I'm here to show you this example that God has so much long suffering that he's allowed someone like me to get saved. Paul said he was chief among sinners. He literally persecuted and fought against God. He's a prime example of the love and mercy and long suffering of God in Jesus Christ. But there's also a critical understanding when it comes to reconciling such a loving God with the concept of someone being a reprobate. Let's jump up a couple verses in context here of what we just read. Look at verse number 12 in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy. Why? Because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. This is key to understanding all of those sins that the Apostle Paul did. He did it ignorantly, meaning because he didn't know while he was in unbelief. He did all of those things. It was ignorant sin. It was, it was things that he did. Yeah, they were grievous. Yeah, they were bad. And yes, God is long-suffering. But he, when he was doing it, he thought he was doing God. So he thought he was trying to do the right thing. And he did it ignorantly, not knowing, because he didn't know the salvation of God. He didn't know what it took to be saved. But here's the difference between the Apostle Paul and a reprobate that he describes in Romans chapter 1. Verse 21 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. That is not ignorance. That is willful choice. They knew God. See, Paul didn't know God. Paul was, was living out the life of a Pharisee, doing what he thought was right. Just, you know, he, was, he was ignorant. He had unbelief. But he did all these sins. But when, he, when, he, when Paul knew God, or Saul, when Saul knew God, he didn't reject him. When Saul finally knew, oh, oh that's the gospel? He accepted him. When he knew God, he glorified him as God and he got saved. And Romans 1.28 says, And even as they did not like to retain God and their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind. The reprobate is someone who knows about God. They hear the gospel and they reject it and they don't even want to have God in their mind. They have nothing to do with it. So that is why someone who is calling himself chief among sinners, like the Apostle Paul, to get saved because he had mercy because he did it ignorantly in unbelief, which is the vast majority of people are ignorant and sin through unbelief. But the people who know God and willfully just reject him, that's where the reprobate comes in. That's where God rejects them when they reject him. When they don't even want to retain him in their knowledge, that's where it comes in. Not everyone not every person that is an unbeliever is a reprobate. And this is a false teaching that's out there. Some, some independent fundamental Baptists even are saying that like, you know, well, everybody was a reprobate until they put their faith in Christ. That's false. I mean, you can look at Roman, you can look at these doctrines. It's not that hard to see that it's people that did not want to retain God in their knowledge that are reprobate, not your average unbeliever. Because I'll tell you, even for myself, before I got saved, I was not just... I don't want to have anything to do with God. I don't want to keep him in my mind. I don't, you know, I didn't even know, I didn't even know what salvation was. I was ignorant of it. Didn't even know. But when I finally found out what it was, I believed. Just like anyone who gets saved. 
You didn't even know. I talked to so many people that they didn't even know. It is, you know I went over this doctrine of you know, people repenting of their sins. There's a lot of people that thought they were saved. They realized that. They said, you know what? I didn't even know. I didn't even realize. I thought that that, I, that was part of my salvation. I thought that I had to give up all these sins. And I was wondering, am I even saved because I would do some other sin? And I said, you know, I didn't, I didn't get rid of that sin. But then they finally hear the gospel preach. They say, you know, I never understood it. I never fully grasped. And it's completely free. That it's, that it's, that it's, you accept that gift and you're eternally saved. You're eternally secure through Jesus Christ. But they just were ignorant. They didn't know any better. The reprobate is not ignorant. They're not ignorant. They know because they made the choice to reject God. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the, the clear teaching from your scripture, dear Lord, for the, for the love that you have for us, for the greatest love that you had to come and die for the sins of the whole world. Lord, it truly is an amazing gift, um, and we thank you so much for it. Lord, help us to, to offer up our bodies a living sacrifice. I pray that, that everyone here would have that heart to, to love you and to serve you, and I believe everyone here does. But I pray that you would please just, just lighten up our path and help us to know the right ways and help us to bring that loving gift of salvation to the lost world. Dear Lord, please uh, lead us and direct us this afternoon as we go out to preach the gospel and that you would help us to reach those that would be receptive, that would be willing to listen and to receive your word as truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.